and uh, welcome to the Africa Resilience Forum. Uh, thank you for joining us for this three-day flagship event uh, designed and hosted by the African Development Bank. Uh, my name is Ellie. I am delighted to be your MC for this fourth edition of the forum. And we have an amazing program in store for you uh, this year. You will be uh, hearing from all the top voices uh, of the continent, uh, government officials, high-level leaders, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, uh, major uh, financial institutions, peace builders, humanitarians, uh, activists, innovators, the youth, the elders, they have all chosen to be here to join the conversation, uh, to share best practices and to lay the groundwork to build a stronger, more resilient Africa, uh, both in the face of COVID-19 and beyond. Our mission during these three days is to uh, provide a space for action-driven conversations. And we will actually be, copy, uh, be covering sorry, a broad range of topics. Uh, today, we will be focusing on uh, the big picture, the key issues that influence the fragility and the resilience of the African continent. Uh, the number one obstacle being, of course, insecurity amplified by uh, climate change. Tomorrow, we'll explore the uh, priorities to focus on as we strive to build uh, this resilience with a special feature on job creation and women's entrepreneurship, as well as the uh, development of a robust pharmaceutical industry. And uh, last but not least, on day three, we will discuss how to harness the uh, private sector to scale up and uh, accelerate resilience. So once again, welcome and uh, thank you for tuning in to the Africa Resilience Forum. Now, I would like to ask you to please join me in introducing this person right here that I believe you already see appearing on your screen. He is the architect of this event, Dr. Akinwumi Adesina, president of the African Development Bank Group. Uh, Dr. Adesina, hello. The floor Hi. is yours. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are listening, we are listening to you for your excellency, Your Excellency, Mark Isal, President of the Republic of Senegal. Your Excellency, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former President of Liberia. Your Excellency, my dear brother, Musa Faki Muhammad, Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Thanks for being here. Honorable Ministers, my dear brother, Dr. Tredros Bebre Yesus, Director General of World Health Organization, heads and representatives of international organizations and agencies represented here, the distinguished guests, bank staff, board of directors, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2021 Africa Resilience Forum. If there was ever a time to be resilient, it is now. Times are tough as the world and Africa, Africa face enormous challenges. challenges from health, health finance, finance, and, and climate, climate stresses. stresses. But we, we must, must not be deterred. deterred. We, we must build, build resilience. Resilience, resilience is, is the capacity of our region, countries, institutions, and the vulnerable people groups to bounce back better, stronger, and quicker in the face of unprecedented shocks and challenges. In the face of these challenges, the African Development Bank Group, your bank, continues to invest massively in operations that promote inclusive growth and build resilience. Since commencing my first time as president of this bank six years ago, more than 335 million people have benefited from our important work collectively. But over the last 18 months, the world and Africa had to confront head on the multifaceted challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. The loss of lives and incomes, reduced foreign direct investment and trade, and an overall dip in the quality of life for our people has taken a huge toll. 30 million people were pushed into extreme poverty due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and another 39 million remain at risk. Before COVID-19, six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world were in Africa. The pandemic has reversed some of those gains. Aside from the cascading effects of the pandemic, new challenges have arisen from insecurity, which if not addressed, will severely impact the success 
of the African continental free trade area. While the guns of interstate conflict and wars are silent for the most part, there are loud and emerging non-state guns increasingly resorting to cross-border banditry, criminality, and terrorism. The bank group is concerned about the untended impacts of these insecurities on economic growth and development. Terrorists continue to decimate the lives of vulnerable populations, especially of women and children. Young girls either drop out of school or are forced into early marriages. As we speak, the number of people in forced displacement have increased dramatically. Today, Africa holds one third of the world's refugee population, majority of whom are women and children. Across Africa, rising expenditures on defense and security increasingly displace development financing on essential services such as education, health, water, sanitation, and affordable housing. Pressure on government budgets continue to divert scarce resources from development investments towards short-term relief measures. These compromises long-term resilience needed to bounce back better. The bottom line is that peace is key to progress, wealth creation and development, sustainable growth and social prosperity. Only by working together as humanitarian peace and development partners, can we effectively address root causes and focus on strengthening interventions that respond to what I call triangle, disaster triangle, which has to do with unemployment, environmental degradation, and extreme poverty. Wherever you find this disaster triangle, you have instability and insecurity. There is therefore a compelling case for innovative financing mechanisms to tackle these challenges. Recognizing this critical link between security, investment, economic growth, and development, the African Development Bank is collaborating with African countries to develop and structure innovative financing instruments. This includes security index investment bonds to mobilize resources to address the root causes of insecurity and protect investments and livelihoods. Aside from COVID-19 and insecurity, we must pay close attention to climate change. Today, climate shocks are becoming more frequent, more severe, and more unpredictable. Nothing brings that into sharper focus than the recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The report shows clearly that Africa is warming faster than the global average, and that the continent will see an increase in extreme heat waves and a noticeable rise in coastal sea levels. The African Development Bank is at the forefront of this battle on climate in Africa. We have committed to double climate adaptation finance to $25 billion by 2025. We have expanded the percentage of financing devoted to climate adaptation from 26% in 2016 to 67% in 2020. And just last week, I had a very fruitful discussion with President Biden's Special Envoy for Climate Secretary John Kerry. We discussed Africa's climate emergency and financing and our collective COP26 preparations and U.S. support for closing an annual $27 billion climate financing gap for Africa. It was, of course, a great opportunity to applaud President Biden's announcement to double the U.S. government's contributions to climate finance to $11.4 billion a year by 2024. Closer to home, we were able to highlight the bank's efforts to mobilize private sector and partner financing for climate change and several bold initiatives, including Desert of Power, which is designed to provide 10,000 megawatts of electricity via the solar in the Sahel and provide electricity to 250 million people. It is our goal to ensure that this project becomes the world's largest solar zone. The African Development Bank and the Global Center for Adaptation have also launched 
the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. Together, we are mobilizing $25 billion to fast track actions on climate change adaptation across the continent in partnership with the African Union. In partnership with the Africa Risk Capacity, also the African Union, the bank has launched the Africa Disaster Risk Financing Initiative to provide risk for insurance to countries, to build support, to engage resilience, and respond to exogenous climatic shocks. The hydra-headed challenges of this pandemic, insecurity, and climate change continue to impact young men, women, and children the most. Given the many shocks and their impact on the most vulnerable populations, we must increase investments for social protection, safety nets, and resilient and affordable health care systems. We must also prioritize job creation, especially for the youth. That is why the bank created the Youth Entrepreneurship and Innovation multi donor Trust Fund, an initiative to support Africa's entrepreneurship ecosystems and help to create 25 million jobs by 2025. To further drive inclusive and resilient growth, especially for women, the bank's affirmative finance action for women in Africa, which we call AFAO, supports women-enabled businesses. To be clear, when women thrive, Africa prospers. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we must not be deterred by the enormous nature of the challenges facing Africa. We must rise above them and build back better against all odds. We need resilient economies. We need resilient communities. We need resilient people. Only when people and communities are resilient can nations be more peaceful, stable, and prosperous. That is exactly what we must do. Together, let us make this happen. Thank you very much and welcome once again. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, for this wonderful opening and getting this ball rolling. Um, we recognize the, the intellectual heft that you brought to the African Development Bank that's recognized uh, globally. Um, the goalposts, I must say, of the emerging Africa stand on two important legs. Um, one, of course, is the financing leg, which you so adeptly control. And the other is the political, uh, represented by the African Union. It is my pleasure, sir, if you don't mind, to bring in the second, the representative of that second leg of the African Development Endeavor, and that is His Excellency, the Chairman of the African Union Commission, Mr. Musafaki Mohammed. Your Excellency, sir. Thank you very much. Merci. À vous, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président et chers frères Adesina. My brother and Mr. President, Dr. Adesina, let me first thank you to inv have invited me to this forum because the subject is very close to my heart. I'm also a citizen of Africa and this problem of resilience on the continent is very close to my heart. We have a lot of challenges and they are big. So what I would like to do now is, is to underline four observations that needs to be taken into consideration about who is questioning our resilience or adaptation and our willingness to solve the problems. My first observation is very obvious. It's all about a huge potential in human resources and our raw material coming from our land. Our population is now 1.3 billion people. 
where we have more than 60% of young people. But it gives a unique chance of creativity. When we know that the United Nations projections say that in 2050 we will have 2.4 billion people. The wealth of our ground, mines, agriculture, etc. makes a huge reserve in terms of raw material that is one of the biggest in the world. Our natural resources are very important. 7% of the gas production between 2011 to 2018 happened in Africa. Africa has huge petroleum uses. The tune of 450 billion barrels, or 7% of uh, global resources. Africa hosts numeral resources vital for the energy industry and has about 20% of global uranium uh, deposits and 40% of, of ma manganese. As you can see, Africa's assets for full resiliency are huge. The challenge is, dear friends, is to ensure the challenge is, as I was saying, to reach uh, resilience and uh, fast track economic growth by harnessing our natural resources and giving a philip to our cultural production the covid 19 pandemic made it possible to identify categories of population and economic sectors that are vulnerable and require a new vision for reform my second observation is on the livelihood the existence continent-wide of an organization which, in spite of shortcomings, will forge ahead in spite of contrary winds. Flagship programs that are found in the 2063 agenda show that gradually on a macro management uh, perspective, we are giving ourselves the tools for resiliency. Ongoing reforms and the establishment of uh, the African continental free trade area are pathways for our development and self-centered growth. Dear brother Adesina, I know that the African Development Bank plays an important role in the implementation of the Agenda 2063, and it is rightly so that it's been tasked with sourcing for funding for the effective implementation of our flagship projects. Managing the COVID-19 crisis particularly and the emergency programs set up by the African Union give us an interesting experience which we can harness to build resilience of the population in the face of shocks. My third observation is on doctrinal issues. That is, we have to count on our own strengths, our intra-African solidarity, and promoting principles within which there's a need to solve African problems by Africans. And this is a guiding principle. This principle lays the foundation for genuine resilience. Against this backdrop, there's a need to set up mechanisms for shock management, particularly climate change, epidemic, financial drop of uh, raw material prices, etc. Most of the countries on the continent are vulnerable to shocks and that lead to high indebtedness with negative impact on uh, the living uh, conditions of the people. In this regard, creating financing tools to manage this risk is vital. I also know that the African Development Bank has uh, set up a number of these arrangements, but I call on you 
to create other tools because it is worthwhile and the situation calls for such tools. Fourth observation sends us to our attachment to new forms of strategic partnership. That is an important aspect of our institutional reform. And I mentioned this earlier on, relying on our own efforts without uh, turning our backs to our strategic partners. That is our vision of a renaissance of multilateralism, which we are all yearning for. I believe that the issue of financing, particularly uh, debt management, financing peace, as well as renovating developmental aid should be raised within the framework of uh, the rebirth of multilateralism. For such a vision of our resiliency to be born and to take root in our governance, political and social practices, there is the need to have a combination, a rational, streamlined combination of all the forces of the continent. In this regard, the private sector, academia, public and private societies, civil societies, are all invited to play their role in this endeavor. We are pleased, my dear Adesina, of what you are doing for this synergy to move in such a way that it gives more resonance to the beauty it intends to create. I thank you for your very kind attention. And of course, I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm sure I will learn more from the questions than from what I've said. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Your Excellency, for your speech. Let me also point out that uh, this forum is being streamed live on CNBC Africa. I will now um, hand over to the president of the African Development you Bank. Have, you're known for the great ideas you brought to this institution. You've enunciated quite a number of them. You've been credited with and awarded for some truly brilliant ideas, uh, which we all know about. <clears throat> what lacks in our development, though, is the the absence of the spirit of implementation of some of these great ideas. I have to ask you, sir, how would you, Dr. Desina, how would you assess your institution's ability today to impose and to improve Africa's uh, development trajectory, Mr. President? Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank uh, my dear brother, uh, Mustafa Aki, for his excellent remarks. And always great to uh, work with you and, and, and partner together for Africa's uh, uh, development. Now, um, in terms of the what we're working towards, you know, we don't work for ourselves. We work for a continental goal and a continental mission. And that has been very well set out by the African Union in the Agenda 2063, which is the Africa we want. And so what we did at the African Development Bank when I was elected president uh, in 2015 was to actually set out what we call the high fives. And the high fives are basically to light up and empower Africa, to feed Africa, to uh, industrialize Africa, to integrate Africa, and to improve the quality of life for the people of Africa. Now, what's actually quite amazing about this was there was an, there was an independent assessment of this done by the United Nations Development Program, which found out that if Africa achieved these high fives, it will have achieved 90% of the Agenda 2063 and also 90% of the SDGs. So basically the high fives of the bank are the heart and, and the pulse of how we actually achieve these great ambitions that we have as a continent. Now, over the last five years, for example, that we have been doing this, it's now in the sixth year we just started, we have been able to have uh, 300 and 35 million people impacted by the work of the bank. Take, for example, the case of electricity. We've been able to uh, support 21 million people to have access to electricity. And I, I remember when I went to Kenya and, uh, 
and, and I was in one of those uh, villages in the, uh, 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 in the Rift Valley. And it was a last, last mile connectivity project. And we were connecting 1.2 million households to electricity by helping the poor to get access to uh, the connection charges by lowering it. And the government of Kenya did a fantastic job. And I was walking towards this particular uh, heart. There was a lady right behind me and her name was Grace. And they were saying, oh, you know, uh, right in front of you is the president of African Development Bank. And I was listening to what she was saying. Oh, she said, well, I don't know the president of the African Development Bank. All I know is that I never had electricity before, and now I have electricity. That's the kind of thing that we're, we're doing, changing lives of ordinary people every single day. Take the case of agriculture, for example. We've been able to provide through our support roughly 76 million people with access to improved technology via agriculture. You look at financing, for example, at least 12 million people having access to financing through investing companies that we actually uh, invest in. You take a look, for example, at water and sanitation, which is actually very, very critical for Africa. Another 65 million people benefiting from that. And you take the case of uh, 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 transport, I can go on and on on those. So all that to say that we are delivering results and that's why I want to particularly thank my brother, uh, Musafaki, you know, when he came to support us, uh, to support me actually when I was asking for more resources for the African Development Bank to be able to do more. And so I am delighted that uh, our shareholders uh, gave us a huge increase in general capital of the bank that moved our, our capital of the bank uh, from roughly $98 billion to $203 billion, which is the largest ever in our history since uh, we were set up in 1964. So we will continue to push. Now, I just want to say one thing about the whole issue of results. We actually measure our results very well, and we are, are, are very pleased with where we are. And I know that my brother, Musafaki, will tell you that every single day, you know, we, we, we don't rest until we make sure that we can change the trajectory of Africa's development and make sure we accelerate Africa's development. We are very impatient uh, with accelerating that development. Thank you so much, Mr. President. We are uh, living proof. I mean, what we go through as we travel across the continent, we are living proof of what you have achieved in the six years you've been at the bank. And um, we, I, on behalf of the ordinary citizen, which I am the man on the streets, we thank you for what you've been able to do so far. I'll turn to uh, Son Excellence, uh, Monsieur, I have a small question for His Excellency Musa Aki. The African Union deserves, and rightly so, it's a preeminent role in the decolonization of the continent. But uh, things have changed, the world is evolving, times have changed. And right now we are facing several challenges, that is industrialization, modernization, cyber security, etc., etc. Your institution, Your Excellency, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, is it ready to play a new role, a central role in this uh, new dispensation that uh, Africa is facing? How can you assess the capacity of the African Union to Don't respond to all these challenges, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. You have uh, given a background that is the AU and the African Union has played an important role in decolonization and in the, uh, liberal, uh, in the freeing the continent. And I think this has been done to the satisfaction of everyone. The morphing of the Afri Organization of African Unity to the African Union uh, took us to the next stage, which, which is the integration of the continent. It is true that Africa is facing daunting challenges, as I recalled in my introductory statement. We have assets that can enable us to be resilient indeed. The goal that we have laid down in our agenda 2063, which is uh, a comprehensive and participatory vision and a projection into the next 50 years is to have this prosperous and integrated Africa. Right now, we are facing significant challenges. For instance, in the area of peace, 
if today there's almost no in, uh, conflicts between states, although we are facing the phenomenon of terrorism, we are also facing challenges of political and economic governance, which themselves are the source of uh, conflicts within states. We therefore, well, we have all the instruments, both economic and the political, that we have to implement. I am one of those who are not totally satisfied with the situation on our continent. I think we must do better. The reform initiated some years ago also has have the goal of rendering operational the African Union with all the ideals and objectives that have been set with institutions that are capable of implementing what we have decided on. The launching of the continental uh, free trade zone is a flagship project that we are implementing, but which itself requires a number of prerequisites, including infrastructure issues. My brother, Dr. Adesina, knows very well that to interconnect this continent here, we need billions and billions of dollars every year. We cannot do trade if we are not physically connected, if there are no roads, if there are no ports, if there are no railways, if there's no electricity. This would not be possible. This is a challenge that is at the center of our concerns today. Yes, Your Excellency, I don't mean to interrupt you. I know that we need to speed up uh, given our time constraints. President uh, uh, Adesina has talked about these uh, daunting gaps, but that we shouldn't be discouraged in the face of these challenges. You yourself, as a chairperson of the most important institution, uh, along with the ADB. How aren't you discouraged when you see how the others throughout the continent are doing to overcome these challenges? No, we cannot be pessimistic. That is not an option at all. I am as committed as my brother, Dr. Adesina, and we're working together on most of the uh, subjects I was talking about uh, reforms in less than three weeks, we will be having uh, this uh, summit in during the mid-year, uh, a coordination summit where all the members and the ADP will come to take stock of projects and the development uh, institutions. The assets are there, and people are very aware now. And uh, we have uh, reached a milestone, even though challenges like the COVID-19 come to slow down uh, our approach. But I think that with the contribution of each and everyone, we'll be able to uh, rise above those challenges. The chairperson uh, was just saying, you know, I mean, we, we, we're, not, we're not here, uh, we're not put here uh, to to uh, goof around and, and, and just think that uh, the world is easy. It's because the world is tough. That's where we're in, in the positions where we are. We lead our organizations. Our job is to make sure that we mobilize all the resources that Africa needs to be able to tackle many of these challenges. In fact, many of these challenges are opportunities. As the chairperson was just mentioning the whole issue of energy, he is from Chad, right? I am from Nigeria, in both of our countries. Also, you see the challenges we have with electricity, as is normal all across African countries. Yet, God is good to Africa. Okay, you look at the Sahel, the irradiation, the sunlight irradiation alone, you know, it's one of the highest in the world. And so we've decided to tap into that. And that's why we launched what is called the Desert to Power Initiative that I was mentioning in my remarks. This is very important because that will provide electricity for 250 million people. And you can imagine what that does. It stimulates economic activity. It creates jobs. It reduces migration. It builds more resilience all across the Sahel. And it also allows those countries that are, are basically landlocked countries to participate in the Africa continental free trade area, which are uh, manufacturing capacity, as the chairperson was saying. But one thing I also want to say that keeps the chairperson, I'm sure, and myself awake at night is what he said in his remark about insecurity. You know, we, 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 we look today in the Sahel, we look in the uh, Horn of Africa, we look all around, we see a lot of insecurity. Essentially what's happening is that insecurity, if we do not manage it, 
is going to constrict the investable space in Africa. And that is happening in some areas. Now take the case of Mozambique, for example, you know, where we actually help with the Africa Investment Forum to help Mozambique to structure a $24 billion deal uh, with Total and others uh, that will make Mozambique the third largest exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world. And it will earn a probably of $66 billion. All of a sudden, terrorists went over there, right? The terrorists are always looking for weak points in Africa. And I think that we must now move away from just thinking uh, just military alone will do it and have the connection between security with investment, with grow, I mean, uh, uh, growth and development. I want to commend, for example, the quick intervention of the African Union Commission, uh, working very closely with President Kagame of Rwanda on the place uh, uh, of getting soldiers there, Galilean troops of Rwanda there, but also for the SADC forces to be in there. Now, thank God that that is now being resolved, but we must make sure that we have the, the instruments. And as the chairperson said, that's why the uh, African Development Bank has is developing right now this thing called the Security Index Investment Bonds. These will allow us to support countries and regional economic communities to mobilize resources from the global capital markets, low, low long-term interest rates, to do four things. First, reinforce Africa's security uh, uh, architecture. Second, to rebuild damaged infrastructure in many of the areas that have been impacted by terrorists. Critically, and third, is the issue of social infrastructure, water, education, schools, all these things are very critical to build social capital in the population. And finally, we must make sure all across Africa, where we have critical investments, the chairperson was mentioning minerals, oil, gas, metals in his remarks. All those areas are the areas that are the growth hubs of Africa, but they are also the wicked points that the terrorists go after. So one of the fourth things that we must do is make sure that we actually create good protection and defense system around Africa's strategic investment areas. Now, these are very, very important issues. We believe that it's time for multilateral development banks to really wake up and recognize this issue of insecurity and find new tools that support countries to meet it because their resources alone are not enough to do that. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Mr. President. And um, we, 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 this program has been on CNBC Africa. We're just about to leave, but I've I can't help but ask you one last word to those who are listening beyond the shores of Africa. What do you want the rest of, how do you want the rest of the world to react to, to all that's going on and the, the problem of disease resilience in Africa? I'll let, I'll let uh, the chairperson go first. Okay, excellent. I would merely say, as I said earlier, I will uh, summarize uh, the agenda 63. Uh, integration prosperity. We have made important strides in the area of security. In the area of uh, prosperity, there's uh, is, is increase in what we have achieved, especially when we look at the, but there's still lots of potential. If we look at the human potential, and in terms of that, President Adesina made this. The Africa needs to count should depend on itself. In spite of the economic and financial situation of African countries, they put in place the G5. In the past, there was lecture, the multinational uh, joint forces have made it possible to reduce significantly Boko Haram's influence. What is happening right now in Mozambique with the support of Rwanda and of Sadek? And all of this with the support of the African Union Commission is also a message of solidarity for peace and stability to uh, silence the guns. We have made quite some progress. And that is why I talked about financing peace within the framework of the partnership and within the framework of multilateralism we cannot fail to take into account peace because without peace, we cannot achieve development. Mm -hmm. So it is up to the Security Council of the United Nations uh, or whether we're talking about financial uh, partners and the 
the ADB has already given made an, given an advantage because it is thinking about financing peace because if we cannot finance peace, we cannot put in place the real programs that we find in Agenda 63. Uh, you know, NEPAD has been working with the African Development Bank with all the other partners on areas of health. The CDC has been an extraordinary tool during this terrible uh, pandemic that has made it possible for us to have a joint and a common strategy in the area of health that has made it possible for us to uh, reduce the impact of uh, this crisis, of this pandemic. Um, so we're working with the ADB, with our institutions, to uh, mitigate and, and unlock this potential of these youths and the African women so that they can uh, tap into their intelligence and talents. Thank you, Your Excellency. I will now give the floor to the President. My dear brother, the chairperson, for the excellent work that he's doing at the head of our commission. Um, I, and I want to also, um, you know, assure him of the, of the relentless support that will continue of the bank to support your efforts to keep our continent safe and to keep our continent resilient in terms of investments coming to the continent. I want to just make three points. The chairperson mentioned the whole issue of uh, COVID-19 right now. You know, we have roughly about 3% of our population that's actually now are vaccinated. And so, you know, Africa cannot, and we will not, uh, again, uh, outsource our health to the generosity of others. What if others are not generous? And so we've decided, and the African Union started uh, with the uh, African Pharmaceutical uh, Manufacturing Plan, which we strongly support, and the African Development Bank will put in $3 billion to support African indigenous pharmaceutical companies to being able to manufacture active pharmaceutical ingredients on the continent that secures our own uh, ability to address the epidemiological uh, challenges that we have that are specific to us. We still have malaria, we still have TB, we have HIV, AIDS, we have hepatitis, we have cholera, we have all of this. But that requires that we actually fund the pharmaceutical work ourselves. The second one is on the age of vaccines that like Chairperson was talking about. I think I am really delighted that we have a number of companies that are relocating to Africa to set up their own manufacturing capacities. Uh, Johnson & Johnson in South Africa. We have also uh, Pfizer, BioNTech in Senegal and also uh, in Rwanda and other places. That's a good start. But at the end of the day, vaccines are not things you go to a supermarket to take off the shelf. It requires inv increased investment in sciences, in technology, in chemistry, in biochemistry, in biomedical sciences, and also ability to have access to intellectual property rights, not only to be able to uh, produce the current types of vaccines, but to understand the platforms to produce other types of vaccines that would deal with other things in the future. And we are working very closely with the African Union Commission on this to build what I call Africa uh, healthcare security system. We must look at our healthcare as a security system. And last point, just to agree with my dear brother, the chairperson, is on the issue of youth. He's absolutely right on that question. The youth are not the future of Africa. They are the present of Africa. And therefore, given that demographic advantage we have, we must turn it into an economic dividend, investing in skills, investing in entrepreneurship. And just on that, that's why the bank is working now with African countries to help to develop what we're going to be calling youth entrepreneurship investment banks. We're still in the exploratory stage of, of, of that right now. We started work on it, but the whole idea is simple. Develop new types of financial institutions that are going to be devoted exclusively to the business, talent, entrepreneurship of the youth. The future of Africa's youth is not in Europe. It's not in the United States. It's not in Asia. It's in a thriving Africa where we make sure our financial systems gives them opportunities to turn their ideas into great businesses. And some of those great businesses are here already coming up in Africa, but we want to boost it by changing the approach. You've heard me say many times that I generally don't like things when you say we're empowering the youth. You know, I don't know what it means. The youth actually just need investment. We must invest in their talent. We must invest in their creativity. And I think these youth entrepreneurship investment banks will make sure that we actually are financing 
the future of Africa today, building world-class businesses of our young people from the continent. So once again, let me thank my brother and just to assure everybody that as he continues to do his great work on the political side uh, of our union, uh, we will continue with his support and others, all of our partners and shareholders to support that vision, the Africa we want. And by God's grace, we will get there. Better words were never spoken, Mr. President. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Akinwumi Adeshina and uh, Your Excellency Musa Faki Muhammad. We thank the audience of uh, uh, CNBC Africa for uh, being with us through this program and uh, we will now hand over to the uh, team to continue with the work of the forum, the Africa Resilience Forum. Thank you, Mr. President. Merci, Mr. Le Thank you very much, Mr. Chenje. Thank you, Chairperson. Merci, thank you very much. We must reconcile the two sides of the Africa resilience and a rapid recovery of our economies by, by doing more and better. The needs for resilience and recovery to achieve the SDG requires the involvement of the private sector. To achieve this institutional capacity of our states must be strengthened in order to pilot reforms and the establishment of Fellow chair, chair, legal mechanisms. Furthermore, we need to have real institutional capacity that makes it possible for us to define during this resilience and economic recovery phase the role of the state and of private management. Moreover, we should not lose sight of the importance of developing African human capital, which must play a central role in the strengthening of the institutional capacity and in the promotion of private initiative. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, we must continue to strive to bridge the infrastructure gap to further expand the productive base of our economies. The time has come for the private sector to take the relay to achieve sustainable growth and which creates decent jobs. In this direction, beyond undertaking reforms to create an enabling environment for business, we should put in place innovative mechanisms that will attract private investment partnership that is supported by mechanisms like the project preparation program. With such mechanisms, development financial institutions could further help the private sector to invest more and better. By the way, during the Paris summit on the financing of the African economies that was co-sponsored by His Excellency Maki Sal, Senegal advocated that a portion of the reallocation of the special drawing rights be directed towards development financial institutions to create a leverage effect for the private sector. And the African Development Bank has a crucial role to play in the deployment of these special drawing rights for the benefit of African countries. To accompany this dynamic, states have undertaken to carry on with reforms in all sectors of activity. We also welcome and strongly encourage the decision by the Paris Summit to establish an alliance for entrepreneurship in Africa. Such an alliance supported by the putting in place of innovative mechanisms will make it possible to mobilize more private investment to take up the challenge of sustainable growth that creates jobs. Naturally, all these initiatives cannot prosper without sub-regional stability. Institutional crisis, conflicts, demographic instability, terrorism, and border banditry are today threats to our economies and the sub-regional market. In this regard, our countries and community institutions must work towards building strong states resolutely geared towards sub-regional integration in order to make the expansion of our markets a reality. 
to achieve the successful recovery of our economies, we must coalesce our resources and means to fight certain scourges such as terrorism and the financing of terrorism, money laundering, as well as illicit financial flows. On behalf of His Excellency Macky Sall, President of the Republic of Senegal, I wish each and every one an excellent forum and hope that strong proposals will be made for a stronger and a more resilient Africa. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Minister Ott, for uh, joining us today on behalf of President Macky Sall. She also wished to add her contribution. Let's listen to Patricia Danzi, a General Director of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Honorable President of the African Development Bank, Dr. Adezina, Excellencies, Heads of States and Heads of Government, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is with great honor that I address you today. Switzerland holds a very special place for Africa, not only in its foreign policy. We count 30 representations on the continent. The people of Africa are also at the heart of the Swiss International Corporation. Together with partners, we work on issues of governance, education, health, food security, and economic development, as well as peace and human security, all topics that are key when it comes to strengthening resilience. Africa is a very young and vibrant continent. We owe it to this young generation that we translate our common vocabulary that consists of the 17 development goals into results. This is a commitment that we share with all of you. The African Development Bank is the leading multilateral development finance institution on the continent and an important partner for Switzerland to achieve this 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As a proud member of a voting group, Switzerland actively participates in the discussions and decisions of the AFDB's governing bodies. The work on the fragility agenda is part of our joint efforts. So are the creation of decent jobs and the boosting of innovative ideas. Worth mentioning is our cooperation in the Africa Disaster Risks and Financing Program. Many public and private partners join forces here. They are then held accountable for the results they achieve in increasing the resilience of communities. Tous ceux qui participent cette année au Forum pour la résilience en Afrique ont cinq lettres et deux chiffres en commun. COVID-19. La pandémie nous a tous surpris et nous a rendu humbles face aux défis que la nature nous lance. Aussi, les pays qui se croyaient développés ont été mis face à leur... So, developed countries have had to deal with this situation. This shock shows that how it's important to react quickly relying on in strong institutions to working and effective institutions and experienced uh, competencies. It is difficult to deal with uh, challenges and to mitigate shocks. Let's take uh, the Swiss cooperation, mindful of its growing uh, involvement on the continent and our contribution to resilience uh, will focus on three areas. One, we engage with a long-term vision in order to build a long-term partnership that secure cooperation and dialogue and long-term work. Two, peace and security. That is working together in humanitarian aid in a holistic manner. We aim to contribute to strengthened institutions that work for their people and to establish the conditions for investment and businesses and to provide rapid humanitarian uh, response as the situation would demand. Three, we are result oriented. That would define together with our partners. I commend the bank for carrying out this debate on resilience over the three days of the forum. I'm looking forward to the recommendations that will come out of this forum and the commitment that will be entered into by all the stakeholders. I thank you for your kind attention and I wish you a fruitful debate. 
Thank you, Mrs. Danzi. I'm sure that the delegates who are in Ivory Coast, one of the 96 countries from where um, we have delegates who have registered to follow this forum, are happy for the call out. Um, finally, here are the remarks that uh, Dr. Al Jezza wished to share with us uh, before we kick off today's roundtable conversations. Excellencies, I would like to thank His Excellency Dr. Akinawe Adesina president of the African Development Bank Group for this invitation to speak. Conflicts, fragility, pandemics, and natural disasters are daunting development challenges. 20 of the 57 fragile states listed by the OECD States of Fragility 2020 report are IDB African member countries. Building more resilient societies requires a collective effort from governments, development actors, NGOs, and the private sector. The IDB has supported its African members to build resilience through long-term programs in various development areas. The IDB focuses on addressing the root causes of fragility and instability. Transitioning from relief to development and helping countries bridge the humanitarian development nexus also falls under the bank's approach. Moreover, the IDB supports recovery efforts and mobilizes resources for resilience. At our annual meeting held in Tashkent recently, we launched the first Global Resilience Index. It should help IDB respond to risks and shocks posed by human-made and natural disasters. I take this opportunity to reiterate the Islamic Development Bank's commitment to cooperate with the African Development Bank and other MDBs to build resilience and restore stability to sustainable development. Thank you very much. Dr. Al Jassa, President of the uh, Islamic Development Bank, thank you for this renewed commitment. It is now time to launch uh, today's talks. Um, discussions will be centered, uh, as announced earlier, on uh, the big picture issues and the uh, emerging trends that influence Africa's fragility and resilience. Our first focus will be on uh, insecurity and the uh, growing financial burden that it represents. I am now going to uh, turn to my fellow presenter, uh, Femi Oki, uh, to lead the talks with our esteemed panelist. Hello, Femi, can you hear us? Hello, I can. Hello, welcome everybody. So nice to see you. So, security, economic growth, and investment. As Africans, people who work in Africa, people who love and care about Africa, we know that nexus all too well. What I find particularly compelling about session one is we are bringing you innovative solutions to mitigate vulnerability and fragility. The other reason I am in love with this session is because of the speakers. From Mozambique, Minister Adriana Malaini. From ECOWAS, Dr. Brew. From the IMF, Mr. Selassie. Gentlemen, it is so good to see you, so good to have you all together. We are going to be picking your brains. But first, I would love you to introduce yourself in the context of this discussion. Why is your experience so critical? Minister, you start first. Please greet the forum audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Adrian Malian. I'm here because being a Minister of Finance, security is a very important matter because it's deal with the budget and and also uh, with, the, in general, the, the economy in general. So this is why I thought the, being invited for this meeting was very important for, for me. So good to have you. Dr. Brew, good to see you. Please introduce yourself to our forum audience and tell them why in particular you're important to this conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'm quite pleased to be participating in this uh, forum on resilience in Africa. And I would like to thank the ADB for uh, the invitation. 
Uh, I am the ECOWAS Commission president and as a president of an economic community that is working to prosper, make uh, uh, trade, uh, uh, economic progress and social progress more a reality in the ECOWAS region. Of course, I'm interested in the resilience in Africa. And the specific uh, one that we will be discussing that means security and its link with uh, economic, social development and financial situation is critical uh, uh, for uh, the economic uh, community of West African state. And we have, of course, countries that are facing specific uh, issues uh, in terms of securities. And of course, uh, I am quite pleased to be participating to in this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you, Dr. Brew. And finally, Mr. Selassie, your title, please, please introduce you and why we cannot have this conversation without you. I'm not so sure about that, Tony. Uh, so my name is uh, Abbeva Amro Selassie, and um, I uh, head the IMS uh, African Department. Um, we, of course, as such, uh, deal with and work with and support uh, you know, a host of countries who are in conditions of fragility. Um, the good thing I have to say is that, you know, this is not a permanent condition. Uh, many currently advanced countries, many uh, emerging market countries, and indeed many uh, countries Absolutely. which are enjoying stability and uh, prosperity in our region uh, have had per episodic uh, periods of fragility. So what we try and do is really learn, uh, try and learn what has worked in other countries and convey that advice. Uh, to, to our other members, and of course, support countries through uh, financial support also when they need it. Thank you, and look forward to the conversation. So gentlemen, this is our virtual round table. You all know each other, which I, I, I'm really happy about because you're not gonna be shy about talking from your very different perspectives, your experiences, even challenging each other at some points. So let us get started. One question for one is a question for all. Um, Minister, take us to the northern part of Mozambique and the security issue there, and then connect the dots between security, investment, and growth. It is uh, a vivid example of exactly what we're talking about. Minister, I'm just going to check. Would you unmute yourself and then just start that one more time? Unmute yourself. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you're going to take us to northern Mozambique and, and then tell us about the security issues and then the impact on investment. No, thank you very much. I was saying that, uh, of course, we are, unfortunately, we're facing a very difficult moment in the north part of Mozambique. Hopefully, we have uh, some support coming from SADEC at this moment and the uh, Rwanda, of course. And I think that situation is improving. But uh, we used to have a Cap de Gard province, I mean, growing on average 6%, uh -huh. but, because, but because of this um, uh, situation, the, uh, we, we, we saw, we witnessed. Uh, slow down uh, 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 GDP, and 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 now from six percent in on average 2011-2017, now we have a, from 2017 to 20, minus 3.4. That this economic impact on the on the ground, but also uh, we lost. 5,000 SMEs, meaning that uh, around 600 million US dollars been lost. So it displaced about 800,000 people displaced. So we have to rebuild that. And to rebuild that, you, mean, you, you, you need money, which is not uh, available. So when the, uh, the topic was security, uh, the, the bond, uh, I said, well, it's, a, it's more appropriate for Mozambique <laughs> because I'm, I'm looking for a solution to have how to, over, to, 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 to overcome the situation. So this is a very important um, instrument. I want, I want to commend the, the, well, the, the ADB for, I mean, putting this 
uh, as one alternative instrument to, to co finance. And because we have an IMF here, uh, we will learn from him also how this can be accommodated in all this uh, process of uh, funding. So, capital guard is real a problem, and, and we are uh, looking for a solution. Sometimes have to come from the, uh, the the budget, and and we have very very difficult to to accommodate those uh, uh, fiscal pressure. All right, so I'm going to help you draw the lines here between uh, insecurity and investment. The liquefied natural gas project in Mozambique um, is on hold or it's even postponed. How much has that cost your country? At this moment, um, you know, about 240, 284 and, and enterprise that were directly connected with these uh, activities. Uh, they stop it. More than 47,000 workers, they have, uh, they have to be, uh, uh, I mean, no job. I mean, there was 2,000 small uh, direct contracts. It also uh, stopped it. So, meaning that uh, if this situation is not improving, uh, we will be in very difficult moment, uh, the, the, the difficulties. So um, I'm just talking about the direct impact on entrepreneurs. But if we look at the humanitarian side, uh, it's, it's the, the, the impact is huge. Um, um, and uh, we have to find uh, a solution for that. I'm so glad you said the humanitarian side, Dr. Brew, coming to that, to our conversation, because we're not just talking about money. We're not just talking about billions. We're talking about people's lives, their future development opportunities. Help us connect the nexus. Yeah, of course, without uh, this example that I, I gave now, Minister, Minister, I'm going to share it with, with, with your, your co-panelist, Dr. Brew. So oh, have, have a pause okay, for a moment, okay. uh, and then Dr. Brew will come in, and then you can come back. Okay, okay. Dr. Brew, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you, you know, in ECOWAS, uh, uh, we are facing a very specific uh, context. Uh, you know, the security situation, particularly in the, in the Sahel area, and also in the maritime, because sometimes we forget about that. Uh, as a, a very serious uh, impact, of course, on the humanitarian, but also on the economic, financial, and, uh, uh, and the well-being of the of the people. We've seen a dramatic increase in some of the attack in the Sahel uh, area and the frontline countries. That means the three frontline countries uh, that in the Sahel. So that means Burkina, Mali, and Niger, and also Nigeria in the Lake Basin uh, area are really facing a very strong uh, pressure from those uh, terrorist uh, activities. And uh, we, see, we have seen that uh, in the last uh, few years, and what we have seen, the impact of all those attacks, we've seen the impact, uh, for example, on the, on the GDP. GDP, which was uh, in the last uh, uh, four or five years, uh, ranging uh, average three, three and a half percent, has uh, tremendously declined. Uh, in 2020, 2020 due to COVID. But before the terrorist attack, we were ranging, moving around 6%. So it has, it has an impact. And then the public uh, uh, sector has been facing a pressure. We've seen, the, you know, before the terrorist and the security situation, most of the countries uh, were face, having a deficit around uh, between zero and 1%. Uh, but it has increased. After 2015, when the terrorist and security situation increased, uh, de uh, degraded in this uh, area, uh, with the deficit now ranging around 4%. And then lately, with the COVID situation in 2020, it has increased to above 6%. And GDP, because we have seen countries, because of the terrorist activities, the security uh, uh, pressure increased the spending. Spending increased by one percentage point of GDP. And we've seen also the GDP 
uh, the debt to GDP ratio, the debt situation deteriorating and moving from 23% late from the late uh, uh, the early 2000 to about uh, uh, 40% uh, in the in the between before 2019, and then now we have almost 60 uh, 60%. So uh, it, it, 40%, you know, from 20 to 30 and 40 percent. So what we are seeing is a situation that is very difficult, very difficult. But at the same time, as we know, that security situation has a direct impact on economic growth and social progress, lack of economic growth and lack of social progress also feeds into insecurity. So we need to invest in both areas. We need to invest, of course, in, in, in military spending, in security spending to deal with that. But we also need to invest in the social and economic program. And this is where uh, lies the challenges because with the, the situation that we are facing now, the fiscal space of the country has been reduced. They have lower uh, revenues because of the military, the security situation, the COVID situation, at the same time where the economic and social spending are increasing and when they have to, to face also military spending. So we need to see and uh, take specific action at the national and regional level to really address this, uh, this uh, dub ch double challenge that the country are uh, facing. And I think uh, there are lessons we can learn. I mean, we can, uh, uh, having seen this uh, development in the last four, five, six years, I think we can learn some, some lessons from that. Uh, first, we know that the security situation is not going to disappear overnight. It's going to be at, it's there to stay for some time. So it's a medium and long-term situation that we need to address. And we have to include that in all our development strategies. Include the fact that countries, the region will be spending more and more resources to defend itself against this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, insecurity. Second thing that we also must take into a, account is that these uh, security uh, challenges that we are facing are uh, complex and feeds into some of the, uh, what we call the community uh, situation. We have tremendous center community uh, 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 tension uh, uh, social uh, difficulty. So we need to continue to invest in economic and social program. That's really uh, a key and very important uh, for us to, to, to address that. We need to continue reform. That's very important. We need to make reform so, 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 so domestic mobilization of resources. Dr. Bruce, I may. Yes. You have a wonderful checklist here of all the things that we need to do. Let me just go back on reform, just very briefly, because I want to share the conversation with your co-panelists. What does reform mean for ECOWAS? For us, reform in ECOWAS means uh, uh, several things. First, countries must make reform to mobilize resources, more domestic resources. They also need to make reform in spending more effectively and efficiently, security spending, social program, uh, economic program. We need to really make sure that we are more effective and efficient. We need to also ensure that our regional, our community is more effective in terms of how we manage our free trade area, how we manage our union, our, our custom union. We also need to, and that's a very important thing, once we have done all that, definitely we need additional resources. We need external resources because otherwise it will not be possible. We need to make sure that we have foreign resources, external resources that come and support the program, the reform program that countries are putting together. We are addressing that at the national, but also at the regional level. We have a, an action plan at the regional level to address the security and the non-security, the military and the non-military action. Because as I said, it is an issue about military and, and non-military, that means social and economic. But unless okay. there is, that's very important. Please let me finish sure. quickly on this point. Unless we have right. sub, substantial external resources to support the countries, it will be really impossible. We welcome the G20 decision 
on the on the SDR and on the on the external debt. ECO has benefited almost uh, for 7.7 .7, uh, billion uh, US dollar, but it is not enough. And uh, I would like to remind that the African Union call for a 100 billion financial resources to support Africa. So this is where I think you know our meeting is critical because we need to ensure, and that has been a request, and I'm glad the speaker from Senegal has reminded us uh, uh, that. The SDR allocation, the 650 million, I think my friend from IMF will speak more than that, but the African are calling that the amount that has not been allocated, part of it be redistributed to the African country that are in need. And part of it could be channeled to the institution, such as the African Development Bank that can leverage that and lend back to the country that really need to face the spending, security, and non-security. Okay, let me just bring in uh, Mr. Selassie here. We're talking about uh, extra resources needed for African countries that have conflict or security situations. How does the IMF, how do you look at this issue, this challenge? Thank you, Femi. Um, you know, it's difficult to follow uh, what Minister Malian and, uh, and uh, the President Bru have said, because they've really explained very well um, many of the challenges of uh, countries in the region, particularly those, in, uh, those facing, um, you know, raging conflicts are facing. Um, but one point I would like to add uh, here, though, is that, you know, um, it's important to, of course, address a security challenge, but also uh, as we are framing development policy, as we're framing economic policy, uh, the underlying causes of the of the conflict. Um, in some cases, I think, uh, you know, uh, military, uh, higher military spending is not the only solution. I mean, you have to also be tackling at the same time uh, the root causes of uh, the conflict, whether these are deeply pol political and deeply domestic issues, or in some cases spillover from conflict that's taking place in, in, uh, in uh, other countries. So I would argue that, you know, uh, in the Sahel, there are, you know, there is, of course, you know, a terrible conflict going on, but maybe, you know, uh, in, in countries uh, bordering the Sahel, huh, uh, there, I mean, beefing up security can be the first uh, order type economic and political uh, policy response. But, you know, uh, and, uh, at the end of the day, without addressing the root causes of the conflict, uh, I don't think we'll be able to move on. So that's just one point I felt was missing and uh, wanted to wanted to. Miss uh, Sati, can I ask you? Are you seeing the the funding, the resources going into addressing root causes rather I, I, I than was funding come security? To that. Great, I, thank I, you. I was Great minds. So, you know, <laughs> what, of course, one of the challenges uh, for countries face is uh, the amount of resources they have, whether it's from tax revenue collection, uh, even uh, including aid, is limited, right? Um, and when they face security challenges, uh, what happens is the amount of resources they have goes down even more. Right? So revenues tend to be affected because you cannot collect revenues in the tax protected regions, or growth declines, uh, uh, as, as Mr. Minister Maliani was pointing out about the adverse effects that the delay in the LNG investment is yes. having in Cabo Delgado. Um, and that, you know, at the same time, you have to increase military spending. So that tends to squeeze. Uh, spending on development uh, areas, spending on you know human capital development, and I think that is uh, where we come in. Uh, one of the things you know, um, Dr. Bru knows this because we've had a lot of conversations in his previous capacity, but also uh, he knows the, the conversations that we have with governments in in uh, ECOWAS area, for example. One of the things we've been trying to do is provide resources to allow governments to uh, limit the extent to which development spending is being crowded out by higher security spending. Yeah? So, you know, a feature of, uh, you know, quite a lot of the support with uh, programs and uh, the financing support that we've been giving countries is exactly to avoid the compression, avoid the cuts in domestic spending, uh, development spending that often takes place in countries in uh, conflict. So there is some resource going there, but by no means, by no means, uh, I don't think uh, enough um, uh, as uh, Dr. Brew also pointed out, that's why we've seen uh, death levels in these countries going up. Um, 
I think for the Sahel countries in particular, I think there is a crying need, crying need for the international community to mobilize and make sure that development spending is not being crowded out by uh, security spending. And much more support, I think, is needed. Mr. Selassie, and, uh, that's something can I, we've been advocating. How, how do you advocate for that? So, you know, we make the case, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, as we are putting, uh, as we are supporting countries uh, put together macroeconomic frameworks, uh, we, one of the things we've been doing is highlighting the extent to which the development spending has declined uh, over, over the, over, you know, the last, since 2012, for example, in the Sahel, uh, security spending has gone up from two, on average, 2% of GDP to 4% of GDP, okay? This in countries where total development spending is of the order of six, seven percent of GDP. Imagine, you know, what those countries would be able to do if they could have thirty-three percent more development spending. Okay, uh, so we are often able to quantify uh, and put dollar amounts of how much, uh, you know, security spending is being crowded out and the incremental financing needs countries have. And highlighting that, um, you know, to to uh, the international community, and of course, also providing some resources uh, to try and cover those financing gaps. So we're very active in this work, Sami. So, gentlemen, I want to focus on uh, the most important part of this session, which is the innovative solutions to mitigate against vulnerability and fragility. Uh, I, I am. I, it would be for the, our forum audience to judge if they're innovative but I uh, bring on the solutions. So let me start uh, with you, Mr. Selassie. What is the IMF offering to support countries on the African continent who have security issues right now? How are you helping to mitigate their vulnerability and fragility? So I think there are two main avenues through which we're helping. I think, you know, uh, it may seem unsexy uh, and very, uh, very uh, bureaucratic, but really, I think the first, uh, I think our mandate and really our, our strength as an institution is uh, in helping put together the macroeconomic, the aggregate uh, economic picture uh, in countries, uh, highlighting uh, what the imbalances are in terms of financing, in terms of uh, policy challenges, and working with our governments to uh, find solutions to this. In some cases, uh, the solutions are internal. Uh, Dr. Brew, for example, mentioned the domestic revenue mobilization. So we do quite a lot of work with tax revenue authorities on how to maximize uh, tax revenue collections, which of course is by far the most important source of financing countries can have. A second set of uh, work that we do is also in promoting transparency uh, uh, of how public resources are used. Again, this is incredibly important. Why? Uh, because, you know, one reason why uh, tax payments, uh, you know, people's readiness to pay taxes is low is because they're not sure what governments are using these resources for. So, you know, to tackle corruption, to address the governance issues, uh, having transparent public finances is really very important for strengthening the social contract between government and businesses. So that's another area where we do uh, quite a bit of work in supporting uh, governments. Then last but not least, the point I made earlier on um, advocacy, advocating for countries so that they can get uh, more concessional financing um, so that you know they continue to have fiscal space to address their development challenges uh, is you know, also uh, another very important uh, work that we do. Right. Uh, I, 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 I would not take you up on this challenge about being sexy and bureaucratic, but I think the appeal for our audience, for our forum, is about what happens down on the ground to the people of various different African countries if they benefit, if their development benefits. Uh, Minister, we were talking this week and you said security and funding security is not just about buying guns. It's about prevention. Tell us more. Yes, um, thank you. Yes, of course, I, I think that today, um, what we, we see, the people, they never understood the importance of uh, funding um, security. So we have to do our best to change the mindset of our people that today, Spending in security is equal to investing. 
expenditure is investment, meaning that it, for, for, for now on, we have to look at uh, our production model that, that include capital, include security, and of course, labor. But security is part of the equation. So we have to understand that uh, when we deal with the security, not just militants, we, we talk about police, we talk about all major cyber crime, you have to put all this in one package and incorporate in your, in, 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 in your, in your, in your model, development model. So I'm, I'm glad to notice that uh, uh, ADB bringing this innovative instrument, we will start now discussing in, in the parliament that we cannot complain, we blame ourselves because we are investing in security. Now it's time to consider security as the basic because without security, no investment, no growth, nothing. So we have to take this as a very important issue. So, um, so this is why I welcome these, uh, these new instruments because uh, will help us to, to deal with uh, the uh, budget uh, or fiscal uh, pressure that we are all the time uh, facing. For example, in case of Mozambique, we are support to have a space, fiscal space to support, to support 800,000 people displaced. So we don't have that. We, we are supposed to bring uh, back the, uh, the, the displaced people to their home. But for that, we need to find space in our budget to invest uh, in small business, uh, help them to, to come and uh, start doing something in, in agriculture. So I think that uh, 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 this instrument will, will, will of course, uh, is bringing new, new ideas and uh, we, 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 we will come. Uh, um, Mr. Minister, if, if I may say so, for the benefit of the people who are not uh, part of the African De Development Bank group, um, the African Development Bank is developing security investment instruments. This is something that ECOWAS has been doing for some time now. Uh, Dr. Brew, can you tell me about how you attach and, and how you um, approach security issues from an investment perspective and what investment instruments you are using that work. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, I think we, uh, as, a, as a regional organization, we first, uh, of course, uh, focus on preventing crisis. I think uh, Dr. Selassie uh, uh, mentioned that, uh, preventing crisis, working uh, well uh, before the crisis, uh, rise uh, to at least uh, try to deal with the uh, the condition that uh, can lead to, to to that. So we put a lot of emphasis on uh, on prevention. We focus also also on our uh, early warning mechanism to at least detect as quickly and as early as possible possible uh, threat so that we can address that. And so far, we have uh, opened uh, six uh, early warning uh, uh, mechanism uh, in uh, in, uh, in six countries, and we plan to really reach all the 15 member countries uh, very soon because they are at a well advanced stage. And we are working also on our uh, mandate to deal with light weapon circulation and so on. We focus also a lot on social and economic program, particularly in. Uh, affected area, particularly in area that are subject to really those threats, because we have to make sure that we do not uh, favor condition that will facilitate manipulation by terrorist group. So we have various programs that deal with uh, uh, education in rural areas, health, uh, infrastructure to create a job, you know, for the young people in particular, and also, for the for the women, 
because we have seen that the gender-based violence are always one of the uh, things that happen when we have this uh, uh, insecurity uh, in the countries. Of course, this fiscal space is very important. We have mentioned that we need to uh, help the country have the fiscal space to address the critical investment that are needed to address economic growth and address at the same time uh, security issues. We have uh, looked at the, uh, we have heard about this uh, instrument uh, proposed by the African Development Bank. The thing that is very important, the demand is there because as we said, the member countries, the, the countries, at least in ECOWAS, uh, have the demand and the need to, to, to that uh, due to the situation that they are facing. So we think it is a, mm -hmm. a good instrument, but we need to be, of course, we need to continue to uh, uh, develop to think about the well, the best way it can be it can be uh, uh, put uh, together. Doctor Bru, for the for the benefit of our broader audience, do you want to explain what you know about the African Development Bank's investment? Uh, instrument for security at the moment? How, how do you understand it? Just very briefly. For me, it is, uh, from what I understand it, I think the African Development Bank has noticed, rightfully, that there is a need to support countries that are facing, have been facing in the last few years, heavy security problems that have limited their capacity to address development issues. So there is a need to invest in security at the sense, at the, at, you know, the broader sense, which means not only military spending, but also economic and social program, because the fiscal space for those countries have been reduced. That's the main issue. So one of the key is, from what I've heard, is the, the security index investment bond, which is a good idea. I think we support it. We just have, it has to, in this design, take into account a few, I think, critical and important thing. It should not, in our view, increase unduly the debt burden of the countries because they are already, already at a high level. So it has to be designed in a way that it is really also taking into account this situation. That's why we feel that it's important that the financial support coming from external uh, partners, particularly the SDR issue that was mentioned, the fact that you know, some of the SDR allocation could be uh, reallocated to some of the institutions such as the African Development Bank, could serve to leverage resources to support the member countries. Okay. And then uh, this uh, investment uh, bond, the, 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 the security investment bond, also has to take into account, we need to answer key question, for example, uh, at which if it is being lent to member countries, how? It has to be long-term concessional, uh, concessional lending because of the debt issue. And also, if it is a, a long-term uh, security index bond, is there a secondary market? So there is a few technical issues that need to be addressed. But otherwise, we think that the idea is good. The reality is there. There is a need for that. It's just that we need to iron out some of the key elements that I have indicated. All right, gentlemen, this is your two minute warning. I am going to, in two minutes, ask you to ask each other pertinent, candid, provocative questions. So be ready for that. When we have ECOWAS, when we have the IMF, and we have the Minister for Economic Economy and Finance of Mozambique in the same space, I know there are things we need to talk about. All right, so be ready for that. Be thinking up your questions. But first, Mr. Selassie, this idea of security investment instruments, does that come under the category of innovative solution? Or is it the same old thing, but applied differently? Thoughts? So, uh, thank you, Femi. So, you know, I, I think a key uh, element of any instruments, uh, any modality for financing that we come up with for countries uh, in, in conflict is uh, that has to you know, take into consideration is the, the effect it will have on debt, okay? On public indebtedness, huh? because you'd be in the near term alleviating economic difficulties, but in the long term, 
creating debt issues which, which could come back to haunt the country. So one thing that we've been very mindful of and pushing for uh, for countries in conflict situations facing uh, you know terrorist threats uh, and the like is for them to have access to uh, to concessional financing um, so that they can maintain development spending so that they can you know continue to to address the, the to address the human toll that conflict exacts so I think that's really a very important element. You know, I want to put a little bit of a, I want to try and address a couple of the points that uh, President Brew raised um, in terms of what support IMF has done and uh, could continue to do. I think the first point I want to uh, make is that, you know, over the last year, the IMF uh, has provided financing to Africa like never before, uh, you know, through our rapid financing uh, instruments, um, but also regular regular lending programs, whichever was would be effective, we provided financing to something like uh, 39 countries in, in Africa uh, over the last uh, year, uh, and in an amount you know that's 13 times our normal amount, so close to around 30 billion in financing. And then this year, uh, we've of course had this uh, large SPR allocation, which was decided oh, by the entire nice. membership of the IMF. Uh, which again, uh, about out of the 650 billion uh, allocation, 33 billion has gone to Africa. Okay, again, these are volumes of financing uh, by by historic standards. Really, are are uh, very very large. Uh, you know, not just for the IMF, but really for any uh, external financier of the region. Um, and of course, you know, we're very proud of the amount of fiscal space, the amount of support we've been able to provide the region, because, as you know, uh, the region has been facing an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, crisis. Um, so uh, I think it was important that we provide this financing. And then, of course, there are more discussions still ongoing about how uh, how uh, this SPR allocation that's going to countries with stronger balance of payments positions that will not immediately make use of this can be rechanneled uh, to countries. And I think there's quite a lot of innovative and exciting thinking going on there. And uh, and uh, we're you know we're hoping that the annual meetings will help advance the, the case for this also uh, upcoming annual meetings. And we hope to do more. But just one thing I want to stress is that this financing, okay, is just one part of the solution. And the other part, the reforms that uh, that uh, President Brew mentioned, Minister Maliani mentioned earlier, uh, also transparency on how these resources are used, are the other really very important components um, to, you know, if if uh, if uh, the money is going to be of use to the people, as you pointed out, Femi, on the, you know, at, at uh, that are facing at the coal face, eh? that are really mm -hmm. are facing the, the big challenges uh, in our countries. So that will be key, make, making sure the resources are used to 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 help uh, alleviate conditions for people directly, and also transparently. So you know, governments can show that the money is being used right. effectively, which will help them mobilize more resources going forward. Also, okay, gentlemen, this is your speed round, instant question from the minister, from Mr. Selassie from Dr. Brew, instant question, instant reaction. We are going to do this in five minutes. Uh, Minister, may I be so bold as to say that your question should be to the IMF and about penalizing security investment. Have a question for the IMF. I, I know you were dying to ask this question. We discussed it earlier, go ahead. No, I would not say that uh, penalizing uh, whether, whether I, 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 I hope that uh, the IMF is, is doing it to look at this instrument uh, and uh, when the, the team do DSCA uh, about the country, they have to see if uh, this instrument is included in the stock of the debt and therefore you you have the, the ratios that have to be uh, calculated to assess this sustainability, that sustainability. Okay, so Minister, this, this, this is a speed round. So what, do you yeah. have the question? Do you have the question ready? Or is that just a query? Yeah, but that is the question. Uh, All right, uh, that's the question. question. Minister, that's I'm going to leave question. it there because so, it's the speed so, round. Mr. So Selassie. So, so how, how, how this will be treated in terms of the DSCA? Very interesting. All right, so, uh, instant you know, reaction. So I think, you know, my first uh, reaction would be, we'll look at this, but 
I think conceptually, if the instrument creates debt, if it creates liability, I think it has to be treated as such and not treating it as such is just trying to cover, the, you know, uh, trying to not face reality. However, I think the how we can help is really by identifying alternative forms of financing, uh, grant financing, more concessional type financing, and try and understand what the trade-offs between this instrument and the alternative uh, forms of financing are. All right. Gentlemen, I am pushing you. This is the speed round. We have to have speed with this round. Dr. Brew, instant question for which of your co-panelists? Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, to, 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 to Celestia, uh, uh, sorry to, to pick on you, but uh, uh, I, no, I really want to recall that IMF has been extremely important in doing really support to our member countries and really helping creating the condition for, uh, for, for, for sustained uh, growth. So I really want to, to commend the IMF for that, but just one quick question. I think with the situation in the, in the particularly the security situation and now the COVID and so on, is there, is there room to really have a more flexibility in budget deficit, at least, uh, at least uh, uh, during the time where countries really go through those difficult uh, times? Dr. Pru, excellent uh, question. I'm gonna allow Mr. Selassie to answer it. We are almost out of time, Mr. Selassie. <laughs> So, you know, um, President Bro, as you know, uh, what we highlight really is uh, first kind of, it's not for us to decide on the size of the deficit, it's for governments. Huh? What we really often do is like explain the trade-offs huh? when deficits are higher, what attendant consequences that they can have. But as you know, over the last year, especially, and continuing into this year, our mantra has been the primary, uh, you know, the first focus of policymaking has to be trying to put this pandemic behind us. This, of course, will include uh, having higher deficits to support vulnerable people, to support vulnerable businesses. So, you know, we still think like as much as financing allows a supportive uh, budget condition uh, needs to be pursued. Again, only, subject to financing availability, of course. It's, as it's, only, it's only fair to ask the most popular man in the panel, Mr. Selassie, <laughs> a question for your co-panelists, and it's going to be a fast one. Please go ahead. So a quick question for Minister Malian. Uh, so Minister, I would be really interested to hear uh, how you see what the prospects for uh, the investments that have been halted in the, in the LNG development. Uh, what, what, how do you see that uh, right now? I think that the, the, the prospect is, uh, is good because we, um, the piece is, um, is, uh, is holding. Uh, we have the support coming from as SADC um, uh, countries and also as uh, I mentioned, Rwanda. And uh, I'm, I think that people, displaced people that are returning their home. So we are now in the process of uh, create conditions so that they can voluntarily to go home, not just in pushing to come, come back. So I think that uh, expected um, uh, time of uh, delay will maybe will be reduced because we have uh, these um, we, we can we, we 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 say one year uh, as, um, as 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 a time that uh, allow, uh, allow it to, to to delay the project but i think that taking this situation today i think that that will not be a case so we are doing our best to have everything that we need. So, Minister, Mr. Selassie, Dr. Bru, thank you so much for your excellent questions, for sharing the co-hosting duties with myself. This concludes session one at the Africa Resilience Forum.